Good morning and welcome to Celebration. I'm Todd Valley, Council President at Celebration, and today it's my honor to introduce to you Rebecca, Pastor Rebecca Shervin. Um, Pastor Kyle is out doing a wedding abroad on some um, fantastical trip, I am sure, if Kyle was involved. Many of you know Pastor Rebecca. She has been in the Puget Sound um, for many years with stints in Gig Harbor and Tacoma and Kent, and today she is the Associate Bishop in the Senate. So we are happy to have her. Pastor Rebecca, welcome to Celebration. One time, uh, it would have been probably a year and a half ago when, pa when Deacon Megan Phillips was um, ordained. And so on that time when I came, I got lost on my way because I didn't use my GPS, but today I found you right away. So, <laughs> so it's good to be with you today. Um, I had a wonderful time getting to know people at the first service, and I hope we have a time to chat as you leave today. It is the day of Pentecost, and so it's the day that we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the way that the Holy Spirit continues to be poured out upon us. I think this is a special day of celebration, especially when we think of what we've been through over the last year and a half as church and God's faithfulness. One of the things we're taught that the Spirit does is gathers us, and it just, as we're able to gather more, I just am so thankful for God's continuing um, breath that, that blows us together and gathers us and keeps us in the church. So we're going to be celebrating that today. Are there any special prayer requests that you would like included in the prayers later in the service? So prayers of thanksgiving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so continued prayers for, yeah. Mm. Okay, okay. Wow, so. Yeah. Yeah, having companionship really makes a difference, doesn't it? So we'll include Gary in the prayers, both Thanksgiving, but also continued healing. Yeah, and sister. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other prayer requests or concerns specifically for today? Lois and Oli. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, others. Well, let's just take a quiet moment as we prepare our hearts for worship.
I invite you to stand if you are able as we join in our litany for Pentecost. Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life in the waters, at the beginning of time you moved over the face of the waters. You breathe into every living being the breath of life. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, voice of the prophets, inflame men and women with a passion for your truth, and through them, call your people to ways of justice and compassion. Come, Holy Spirit, burn in our hearts. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, you speak to us of our Lord and show us the depth of his love. Come, Holy Spirit, free us from the power of sin and death. Holy Spirit, wind and flame, fill your disciples with joy and courage, empowering us to preach your word and share your good news. Come, Holy Spirit, dwell in us and lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Trusting in God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sins against God and in one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Mighty God, you breathe life into our bones and your spirit brings truth to the world. Send us this spirit. Transform us by your truth and give us language to proclaim your gospel through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Nathan, I think, is it your turn to come on up and lead us in a children's sermon? Just checking to make sure the mic is working. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning, guys at home. And you know what? I was thinking about that today. I was thinking about how we have been so, it's been so nice that I actually get to talk to you guys from home, too. You guys get to see me, and we get to talk, and we still, you still get to hear the children's sermon. I think that's so cool. And that kind of makes me think about sending a message of God's love. And I thought about it. I think we're really lucky. I can send you guys. I can tell you that God loves you. I can tell you and you can hear it no matter where you are. If you're watching this video, you can hear that. And you know what? If we don't have this, I could always use my phone and text your families or, or text you guys or email. I email a lot. And then that way we can connect and I can say God loves you, right? I can also be on a Zoom, Zoom call with you guys, which we do a lot. I know a lot of you guys enjoy our story time on Thursday, which I love doing that. Um, and I know Ashley. Ashley does Sunday school with me a lot on Zoom and a few of our other kids too. And, and I know Ashley loves to connect. I know I do too. So it's <laughs> really fun for me. There's all these really incredible ways that we can send a message to each other. And I think about our scripture, and I think about when I look at the, the Bible and I look at what we hear and what we learn is that there are other ways of sending messages, too. And you know what? 
They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have internet. They didn't have cameras and Zoom and Facebook. And you know what's still incredible? The, that message that God loves you still got to us 2,000 plus years ago, right? I've talked about that recently. That message still got to us. And we hear that in our scripture story today when we talk about Pentecost and we talk about how the disciples were given the Holy Spirit so then they could go share, right? Because what happened is that God gave the power of the Holy Spirit to Jesus so that he could share God's word with the disciples. And Jesus did that very well. And then the disciples, they received that Holy Spirit too. And they were able to share it with so many other people. And they didn't have Facebook. They didn't have text messaging. And they still were able to share this incredible message that we all know and that I can share with you and that we can all share with each other. And I hope that you guys can share with others. And that message is that God loves you. God loves you so much and cares about you and all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from, no matter what language we speak, no matter how we look, God loves each and every one of us. And that's the message that we can share with others, that God loves you. And that's what the disciples did. So we can be like the disciples and learn how to do that with others. Isn't that really cool? I think that's really cool. I think that's a really exciting thing. So I want us all to think about sharing that message of love. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and close in prayer. And everyone here can help me because you know what? When, we, when you guys say back what I say, we're sharing that message of God. And we're sharing that love. And you guys at home can do it too. Are we ready? Here we go. Dear God, thank you for the disciples who taught others how to receive your Holy Spirit just like Jesus taught them. Help us to share your love like the disciples. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys. Thank you guys at home. We'll see you later. The first reading for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other language, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in these days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. 
and I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the end of our first reading. I invite you to stand as you are able as we hear the gospel reading this morning. It comes to us from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, and is part of this big body of Jesus' teaching that I know you that you heard about last week as well, this farewell discourse that ends in the prayer that you heard last week. This is part of that big, big speech of Jesus's. Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will no, lo no longer see me. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. God's beloved people here at Celebration Lutheran, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and from our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It's good to be with you on this day of Pentecost, the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. According to the liturgical calendar, Pentecost is one of the three major festivals of the church year. It takes its place right alongside Christmas and Easter. Although I'm guessing that none of you gave each other Pentecost presents this morning. And I'm thinking that you didn't hide Pentecost candy for people to search. And I think we're probably not all headed out tomorrow for the day after Pentecost sales. So Pentecost is one of those major church holidays that for the most part exists within the walls of the church, or I should say is celebrated within the walls of the church. We tell this story um, from, especially this one from Acts chapter 2, where we find this event taking place in Jerusalem when some of our ancestors were gathered 2,000 years ago. Now we're told they're gathered on the day of Pentecost. For Jews, that was actually the holiday called Shavuot. Um, our Jewish neighbors last Sunday celebrated Shavuot on May 16th. It was a spring harvest festival. And Shavuot, or in Greek, Pentecost, the five, the penta, was 50 days after Passover. And it was one of the three pilgrim festivals in the life of ancient Jews, where if you could, you would go to Jerusalem to celebrate it. And so this is why there were Jews from all over the Mediterranean gathered in Jerusalem, um, participating in worship together and in all kinds of um, harvest festivities, this is when at one of these gatherings that this dramatic story occurred. A rush of wind, tongues of fire, an experience of God so intense, so transforming, that it became known as the birth of the church. Peter and the others who were there interpreted this experience in context. Now remember, for them, this was you know, roughly 50 days after um, Jesus' death and resurrection. 
So they understood, and they had had all this teaching of Jesus that we heard in the, in the gospel reading. So they understood this event as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit related to the Easter story. Pentecost was not a separate thing from Easter. It was a continuation. It's as if that Easter story caught fire on Pentecost. And it was no longer known just to this small circle of people, like the disciples and their kind of group. But the death and resurrection of Jesus became a story that was known throughout the Mediterranean as these pilgrims went home and told the story. So there's a reason that Pentecost is a day that seems like a fire because it really, it caught fire. The story caught fire. The witness caught fire as people went home. Some people, not all, but some people heard the story and came to understand themselves as part of it. They recognized this covenant-making God, the one who had made covenant with Abraham and Sarah, with Moses, with David. And so a new covenant in Jesus Christ made sense to them. However, they didn't know what that looked like. I love this question, what does this mean that we hear in Acts? Um, if any of you went through uh, Lutheran confirmation in a certain era, that was always the question, what does this mean? That's the question they're asking. Does this mean we're still Jews? Does this mean our faith practices will still be the same? Do we still belong to the temple? Do, and what about Jewish law? What, what place will Jewish law have? Much of the New Testament bears witness to people wrestling with these very issues, struggling to understand what does this new relationship that I'm in mean? And as they were in the midst of all that, another entirely unexpected thing happened. Like a fire that can jump a ravine when there's a strong wind behind it, the good news of Jesus was set ablaze among the Gentiles. Nobody saw that coming. People who had no relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who were viewed as somehow outside the realm of God's concern, they heard the story of Jesus, experienced his wide open embrace, and were drawn into this covenant relationship. They began to understand themselves as people grafted on to the vine of Christ. And they too were filled with questions. What does this mean? Does this mean we're Jews? Are we some sort of weird hybrid of faith traditions? What cultural practices, like what we eat, um, uh, who, we, who we spend time with, what cultural practices do we get to hang on to and what do we need to surrender? How have we been changed because of this relationship with Christ? The birth of the church, when you read the New Testament, was not like flipping on a light. It wasn't just flipping on a switch. Birth is not like that. It is messy and painful and can be long. And any parent will tell you, if they're honest, that you make stuff up as you go. The birth of the church is a story of very real human beings struggling to make sense of this message that had claimed them of this relationship with the risen Christ that had redefined their lives and their understanding of themselves. Paul described this birth as not being only about people even. Remember when he writes, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Throughout all of the early Christian writing we have, we see how Christians guided by the Spirit are trying to imagine what it means to be the body of Christ. I don't know that it's that different today. <laughs> I don't think that it is. We do have 2,000 years of teaching. We have theology. We have doctrine. We have the history of how other Christians have lived. And I find much of that work inspiring. 
The Pentecost brings me back to the primal experience of the Spirit's work in my life and in our life. The Spirit continues to come to us and to set the Easter story on fire. And it continues to stir in us and make us ask questions. What does this mean? What does it mean that we have been baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus? Could it mean that before any other label is put on us, male, female, conservative, liberal, homeowner, renter, gay, straight, before any other label is placed on us, we are children of God, that that is a primary identity. Could this be what that means? What does it mean that we are called to bear witness to Christ in the world? Could it mean that we are part of something so much bigger than our own individual stories? That you and I are actually part of the ongoing work of God, the creative and healing work of God in the world, and that we have been given gifts to do this work? Could that be what it means? What does it mean that we are part of the church? We are not joiners, after all, here in the Pacific Northwest. We are rugged individualists, and we like to march to the beat of our own drum. But could being part of the church mean that I do not have to walk this path of faith alone? That I walk it with other sinner saints who are also struggling to follow Jesus in their daily life and to wrestle with questions? Could it be that it means that the Spirit continues to gather us together? That the same Spirit who breathes in me is the Spirit who breathes in you? And that's actually what we have in common? That is what our common life is? Pentecost is a day for these big questions. We join a long line of people, a great cloud of witnesses who have prompted by the Spirit, interpreted and reinterpreted the good news of Jesus Christ, who have brought this story into languages, so many languages we, we, we can't even imagine, who have figured out in their own cultural context what it means to follow Jesus. Through all of this, the Holy Spirit continues to blow into us, to hold us in covenant with Jesus Christ, to call us, to gather us, to enlighten us, and to make us holy. And then after we are gathered, the Spirit blows us out and scatters us, scatters us to be the body of Christ in the world, to bear Christ in word and deed, so that others come to know of God's redeeming love. We are gathered and we are scattered so that all will come to know this gracious God in whom we live and move and have our being. Thanks be to God. Amen. In your bulletin, there's the chorus to the hymn, Spirit of Gentleness. We're going to sing the chorus through one time together. Do you typically stand or do you remain seated? You stand. Let's stand to do that. Let us confess our faith, the faith of the church, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today we pray for the church around the world that God continue to send the Spirit to renew, inspire, and lead us in paths of justice and mercy. Let us pray. God of life, we pray this day for the church in Africa, for the church in Asia and Australia and all of the islands. We pray for the church in Europe for the church in North and Central and South America, for this congregation, Celebration Lutheran, and for all who search for you. We pray, come Holy Spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bless the lands, the seas, and all your creatures, too numerous to count. Send your lively spirit to renew the face of the whole earth. We thank you that in your wonderful imagination you have created all of the diversity around us. We pray that we would both cherish and that we would care for all that you have created. Hear us, O God. Inspire the leaders of nations to strive for justice and for equality for all. We thank you for the ceasefire in the Middle East. We pray that you would continue to bring peace to Jerusalem, to Israel, to Palestine. We pray that refugees would find a home where they are safe. We pray this day for our legislators, for judges, for all who hold seats of power in government. Grant wisdom to them as they discern how to lead in this time. Unite all people around the world into one human kind of cooperation and care. Teach us respect for those whose language or appearance is different from our own. Hear us, O God. We continue to pray for an end to this pandemic. Restore those who have contracted the virus. Uphold and strengthen healthcare workers and bring your well-being to all countries and peoples. We pray that you would draw near to all who are suffering, those who feel hopeless, those to whom death draws near. We pray for those who hunger, for those who are unemployed or underemployed. We pray this day for those whose needs are known to us. We pray for Lois and Oli as they walk this path, knowing that death draws near, but knowing that death is not an obstacle to your life. We pray for strength and that this time would be a sacred time. We give you thanks for the the palpable way you have answered prayers in the life of Gary. We continue to pray for him and for his sister as they struggle through these issues of health, that healing, they would know healing, and that through it all they would know your grace and your comfort. We pray for those dear to us whom we name aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Bring us comfort and bring us courage for the living of these days. Hear us, O God. With confidence in your love and with trust in your mercy, giver of life, we offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share that peace with each other in whatever is your practice here today.
As we prepare to share this holy meal, just want to say a word of thanks to you for your continued generosity in offering your gifts of uh, treasure during this time. Um, I know that there are so many gifts that are needed to keep a, a congregation going, and we have discovered all kinds of un, unexplored gifts in this time of pandemic, but your ongoing faithfulness and generosity um, is part of what fuels all of that. So thank you for that, and there is an offering, a way to give your offering on the way out of church today if you, if you didn't offer it before. But please, um, please know that your gifts are so appreciated and are such an important part of getting through this time together. So I invite you to stand as we prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures throughout the ages. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea, for leading them through the wilderness and into the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one, for the death and resurrection of Christ, and praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to the remembrance of me. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread and raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life in us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I invite you with your communion kit to take your bread. And as you take your bread and eat it, know that this is the body of Christ given for you. And as those here take their cup of wine and as you at home or have your bread and wine gathered or your bread and juice gathered, know that as you drink this wine, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Wellspring of joy, through this meal you have put gladness in our hearts. Satisfy the hunger still around us and send us as joyful witnesses that your love may bring joy to the hearts of all people. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we all begin this new week, we do so by hearing these ancient words of blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of God, our creator, Christ, our savior, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us in faith. Amen. Go in peace, celebrate Jesus, and serve the community. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. <laughs>